The next biggest request from you guys, so I hear you, I'm listening, is the Sin City Exorcism episode that took place in Las Vegas, which is where I live. I actually did not see this the night that it aired. I wasn't home, so I just literally watched this like a couple days ago. I needed to get caught up. So this starts off immediately where there is a guy that's friends with Zach and his mother died in his arms and the family is claiming that she was somehow possessed by a demon when she died. I think everyone was wanting my two cents on this episode because this guy lives near Warm Springs Road and Paradise and that all of these strange violent incidences are occurring and could they be somehow related and attached to this gentleman, Anthony, including his mother who has passed away from a potential possession. So I'm gonna come out and be completely honest with you guys and tell you that Warm Springs Road and Paradise, where this intersection crosses, is just south of the airport by a few blocks, like a handful of blocks. The east side of the valley which is anything on the east side of I-15. I-15 runs right down the middle on the Las Vegas side. It has always been known for being um, a little bit higher crime rate than the rest of Las Vegas. Anytime I think you know you have an airport, especially an airport that falls in the middle of the city, you're going to naturally get crime around the airport. So because this area is on the east side of Las Vegas, because it does fall within blocks of the airport, it does not shock me that there is some violent crimes taking place. There was a handful of crimes that were featured on this episode of Ghost Adventures, but I hate to tell you that there's usually more than that. There's a lot more than just the handful that you saw. The east side of the valley is sadly known for having a higher homeless population and rate. It's a lot older than the other places in Las Vegas. And so unfortunately, it's just known for having higher crime rates. So I was not shocked with the location of where this house was. Now, Anthony starts talking about his mother. He says that she was sick on her birthdays, that he couldn't look her in the eyes sometimes, that she didn't seem like she was herself. Anthony said his mother spoke about making a deal with the aliens and they had some sort of an inside internal joke that aliens were demons and demons were aliens. She said that the aliens were going to take her because of the deal that she made and he reported her throwing up black, black gunk, I'm not really sure. So the first question in my mind was why didn't they call 911? Because it sounds like she was throwing up black before she died. Like this may have been a reoccurring issue. So my question was why didn't they call 911? Why didn't they get her to an ER? I wouldn't let my mother just sit there and be concerned for her well being. I also would be very concerned if my mother was talking about making deals with aliens. I would be concerned for her mental health and well being and I would have made sure that she got some sort of mental health treatment that she needed, whatever it took to attempt to save her before it got to this extreme. They never really said what his mother died from specifically, which makes me sad because it makes me concerned did she not get the medical treatment that she needed. Anthony said that he was having violent rage outlashes in the house. He was putting holes in the walls and the doors and he also said that he was full of suicidal thoughts. 
The first thing I got concerned about was the girlfriend. We know with historical patterns that people that have some sort of violent outlashes sometimes will also be abusive to spouses or girlfriends or even his sisters or family members. And I had a real concerned feeling when they first introduced the girlfriend on the episode. I don't know what the feeling was. Obviously, I do not know these people personally, so this is not a personal issue that I'm having. But the girl gave me some sort of bad vibes. And in that, I mean, did she know something more? It always seemed like she knew more than what she was saying. She was always holding back. She was covering her face in parts of it, covering her mouth, kind of dazed off to the side. So I was really concerned. It seemed like she knew more than what she was saying. Or if she seems kind of withdrawn that way, that can also be a sign of abuse. So I just hope that if she's out there and there is some sort of violent tendencies happening that she gets the help that she needs. They showed a cord being ran from what looks like some sort of a door or upper level down to the bedroom doors of Anthony's mother and it's wrapped and bound and wrapped and bound. Anthony says that he keeps that door locked and shut and bound because they see a girl in a white dress and quote, they don't want them in there. Zach says he senses death, darkness, and despair within this household. So I did a little bit of research on the bishop that Zach has had on a couple of the episodes. We obviously saw him in Utah and now on this episode for the exorcism in Vegas. So when I looked him up, I found out that the main areas of interest in education is mysticism, Christianity, Buddhism, uh, monasticism, I may have pronounced that wrong, and obviously exorcisms. He, it says his career focus has been a speaker, a bishop, and a mystic. His, his affiliation for religious is the Holy Nicolian Catholic Church Order of Exorcists. It says that he has a PhD, that he is semi-retired. He's worked in Eastern Orthodox, Western Catholic Bishop, and Exorcist of the Old Roman Catholic Sacred Order of Michael the Archangel. And he's also offering private instruction for Zen meditation, mysticism, prayer, and Christian exorcisms. It says that he decided upon pastoral ministry. He was accepted by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Palm Beach, Florida, which is where he entered his seminary to become a priest. Within a short period of time, he discovered his irreconcilable spiritual corruptions within the program and left to educate himself privately. During his undergrad studies and in the order to supplement his training outside of seminary, he was privately mentored in the Catholic the theology for many years by Pastor Emeritus, E-M-E-R-I-T-U-S, of the Diocese of Philadelphia. After he completed his degree in psychology, he worked in the multitude of clinical facilities managing the care of clients which were suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, traumatic brain injuries, before designing a successful preliminary prevention of methodologies targeting at-risk children and teenagers. During this time, he completed postgraduate work in education, philosophy, and metaphysical science, through, through which he received his ministral doctorate and attained it in the title of Metaphys metaphysician for the internal metaphysical ministry. This is interesting. It says, he soon realized it would be impossible to accomplish his vocation with the limitations that were imposed on him by the Roman Catholic Church, which often restricted him to serving only within the Roman Catholic members. He found it necessary to enter into the independent sacramental movement and work his way through independent Catholic ministry, ultimately being consecrated by his bishop under the traditions of Eastern Church. Soon after, he was appointed by his congression to serve as the patriarch of both the Holy Nic Nicolian Catholic Church in the Western Arm. He sat on numerous private boards, worked to resolve inner-city adolescent homelessness, and became an accomplished instrument-rated pilot. 
I'm trying to find some information on <clears throat> how he got into the actual exorcism processes. So this is interesting about him on, let's see, it looks like March of 2017. He was in Georgia, so I'm not sure if he's still there, but he set up a GoFundMe page called the Deliverance Ministry Outreach. He's raised $50 of $50,000 that he's wanting. And it says that he is um, a Catholic church in a federally tax-exempt uh, nonprofit. He is primarily outreaching a ministry to investigate, confirm, and neutralize the threat of demonic attachments operating within the lives of ordinary people. We serve those of Christian denominations and of all denominations. Your generous offerings help the clerical and lay ministers of our church continue to work this extremely difficult and dangerous exorcism ministry. It also provides the means to assist the countless number of clients whom come to us and depend on us for free services for spiritual problem resolution. So it says that they work in Atlanta, Georgia, divisions of the Sacred Order of St. Michael, the Archangel Order of the Exorcist. Requ requests for help come into our order daily and there is simply not enough manpower and financial resources to help everyone that needs it. Your donations assure that we can serve as many people as possible absolutely free of charge. So that says that he's looking for funding to help people that are in need of the right of exorcisms. Just don't get it confused when someone says they have a PhD. That is, yes, the level of a doctorate. However, that doesn't mean they are necessarily a physical doctor, like meaning an ER doctor or a cardiologist. I'm trying to find exactly the school that he got his doctorate at just so that I can look that school up to see if it's an accredited school or is he just talking that he got education in the level of a doctorate degree, meaning he's gone to school for that long. I actually just find it kind of interesting that he got his degree in psychology and he worked in clinical facilities managing, managing the care of clients suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and traumatic brain injury. I almost received my psychology degree and really all you can do with your psychology degree is become a counselor at like a school or you know possibly in a hospital but it would probably be more in the line of like HR work counselor. So for him to say that he was kind of tossed into a facility where he actually worked with patients that were suffering from severe mental disabilities is kind of shocking to me just because usually you don't have the education to be put in a facility like that unless he was actually working at some sort of a modern day asylum. So it says he completed his post-grad degree in education and philo education, philosophy and medical science. So I'm not quite sure what that means. A master's degree comes after your undergrad degree. A master's degree is usually two years. So it says that he completed a post-grad degree in education, philosophy, and does that mean that he has three separate master's degrees? That would have taken two years each. I don't think that you can intertwine master's degrees unless you're getting separate master's degrees in each of those subjects. Now when you're getting your undergrad, like let's say he got his undergrad, like he says in psychology, he can minor in philosophy or perhaps minor in education. But this says that he completed post-grad degree work in education, philosophy, and metaphysical sciences. Well, I can tell you right now, if you're doing post-grad work in metaphysical sciences, that doesn't really exist in actual university settings um, as far as a metaphysical science. So I'm not sure. I would love to know the school he went to just to get more education on it. I'm just playing devil's advocate here, wanting to know his existence and experience in doing actual exorcism since now we've seen him twice on Ghost Adventures. It says he attained the title of Meta physician 
at the International Metaphysical Ministry. So I'm just going to look that up. So that, I'm assuming, is where he's saying he got his PhD. So metaphysician for the International Metaphysical Ministry. Let's look that up really quick. Okay, so the International Metaphysical Ministry is located in Sedona, Arizona. So that actually would make a lot of sense to me because Sedona, Arizona is known for being very spiritually inclined. Remember, I've been to Jerome and Sedona a lot. It's also known for being kind of the metaphysical capital of the United States, so that doesn't shock me. So this, um, this school was opened in 1963. It says it started with six members in 1963, and it has grown with over now 7,000 active ministers. It's a holistic new metaphysical ministry. They do, they've done decades of consciousness research. So basically it says that this school is against closed, narrow-minded religious dogma and it is replaced with open-ended spiritual expression. I'm such an investigator, I'm just sitting here like, I'll find this out right now. Okay, so it says this is how the IMM, also known as International Metaphysical Ministry, operates. It oversees two private post-secondary distance learning schools. So this is a distance learning program, which means you focus all of it online, probably. It specializes in self-paced home study programs. The programs range from bachelor degrees to doctoral degree programs. So it says that it is a it is considered a distance learning program that operates under the University of Meso Metaphysics and the University of Sedona. It's a nonprofit tax tax exempt organization. So now I'm going to try to find out if this is an accredited university. Okay, so this is interesting. I literally looked up International Metaphysical Ministry accreditation, accreditation, and it says literally, so if you go on, I'm literally gonna show you guys my phone right here, okay? So International Metaphysical Ministry is right at the top, and if you just start scrolling down, there's like a letter from Dr. Paul Masters, whoever that is. And then you're gonna hit this section that says overview. Can you guys see all that? So the overview literally says, so anyway, blah, 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 I'll keep going. The information presented below is meant to clarify the puzzling question about accreditation. Accreditation is not yet available for institutions that are purely spiritual or religious without subjects like calculus, English literature, biology, chemistry, math, and so on. So yes, he did obviously do a lot of educational research and studying when it comes to his ministry and who he is. However, the doctorate he's claiming is not recognized through the United States as an actual accredited degree. So I just wanna make that super clear. Sorry this took so long. I really was like sitting there watching this and like I really need to find out about this guy and who he is. Does that make him less qualified or overly qualified? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not like the biggest person on understanding the education behind religious leaders. I was under the assumption with any sort of clergy, things like that, you have to get in with that specific church or organization and basically study and practice below them, below the hierarchies of the church. So it's nice that he says that he has this degree, this doctorate degree, but he's not nationally recognized. So it's kind of like a up in the air sort of it is what it is. He's obviously devoted to what he does and his religion and this spiritual warfare, but it's not accredited and recognized through the education system here. So I guess take it for what it's worth, take it as you will. It's hard to not brag about something like a doctorate because obviously he's gotten his education within his masters and worked up the line but it's hard for him to go ahead and brag about having a doctorate considering it's not accredited and it's not nationally recognized. My point with researching is he is what he says he is to an extent. 
So Bishop Brian comes in with Sister Mary. He's introduced for having this PhD. Now we know the truth behind that. They interview Reese and Shiloh, which are the sisters of Anthony, who also say they witnessed their mom under some sort of a demonic oppression, possession. And yes, she was throwing up black stuff and she was acting weird and talking strange. So we've now confirmed that with Anthony and his two siblings. They said that the mom would go from fine to angry to moody to just kind of flying off the handle. And then suddenly they talk about their dad, which is the mom's ex, who is doing some sort of satanic rituals inside of the house. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, now we get how there was a potential possession happening. They even say that there's some sort of video that exists that's dark and he's doing these rituals with candles. They're saying that he killed animals of the family, which honestly made me feel sick to my stomach. And once again, let's go back to this question. If someone, whether it's your spouse or not, is killing innocent beings, disgusting, why didn't someone call the police? Why wasn't this person arrested for animal abuse? And I hate to say it, but usually, if a family member doesn't want to turn someone in for violent outlashes, such as harming and killing animals, it's because they have some sort of issue with the law, like maybe someone there has a warrant or they're in trouble with the law, or they don't want to get their family member in trouble and they're trying to protect him somehow. But all I'm going to say is, if I had a family member that was hurting and harming animals or people, I would be calling the police on them. If I had a mother who was throwing up black and potentially possessed, I would be calling 911 to get her some help through medical attention. If my mother was saying she was talking to aliens or something crazy, I would once again be getting her medically assessed to make sure that she was okay. Why did they let her sit there and die? Sorry, you guys know I'm gonna see the rational side of this and I'm not gonna change in any way, shape, or form. So suddenly now the bishop tells the family, the, uh, the bishop goes in to meet with the family and they're having this talk. The bishop is told that the mother's ashes are still in the house. The father is still alive and he's probably continuing to do occult things wherever he is right now. Everyone seemed shocked when they said that the mother's ashes were in the house. I didn't feel shocked about that because Obviously, everyone has final wishes, everyone has religious preferences on what happens to your body when you go. It's really a family decision or a last wish will decision. So for them to say the mother's ashes were still in the house, I wasn't shocked by that because families do that all the time. That wasn't shocking. The bishop seemed shocked, Zach seemed shocked, and I'm sitting here like, you're really close to your mom. Maybe there were final wishes. Maybe there was a money issue where they couldn't afford a grave slot and a marker. Do you guys know how expensive it is to bury someone? There's a meme that goes around that's, I think, funny because I find dark humor funny, which is, I can't even afford to die. And that's seriously the truth. Dying at a basic funeral, if you're looking for like a grave slot and paying for the actual... Um, session like having friends and family into the funeral home and, and honoring that loved one you're looking at like a base of ten thousand dollars and that's with cremation now if you're looking at buying an actual casket the caskets are a minimum of five thousand dollars and you still have to pay for the grave marker on top of that my grandmother's grave marker we just got it replaced and that cost me like five thousand dollars six thousand dollars my aunt wished to be have her ashes spread in the Colorado River, which unfortunately that didn't happen. So we did go ahead and pay for her a plaque in this cremation sort of area. But just for the plaque for my aunt, that was like $3,500. And that didn't include her cremation and the actual funeral procession. So maybe this family couldn't afford to get her some sort of a grave slot. Maybe it was her wishes to be have her ashes spread somewhere and they haven't financially been able to get to that location. It wasn't that shocking to me. So I felt like this scene of knowing that the mother's ashes were still in the house was a little bit overly dramatic for me. So Anthony and Anna are sitting on the couch and suddenly they see a light anomaly and this is right before, you know, we're gonna start the investigation. Anna sees this anomaly and she has this freak out and like she's hiding behind Anthony and I still get this sensation that she knows something. 
I don't know what it is. She's a part of something. I'm not sure what that is. But I just feel like the whole time I'm watching this girlfriend, Anna, that she knows something that she didn't share with the audience or she didn't share with even the producers or Zach on set. Anthony feels like he's getting some sort of oppression or possession that starts to happen. The bishop rushes over to him and suddenly it's like the negative energy jumps to Zach. He feels sick and he feels like he needs to leave, so he steps out of the room. At some point, Zach comes back in the room. He starts to unwind this cord that is completely keeping her room shut out and locked out from everyone. And he opens the door and says that the first energy sensation he feels is, quote, intense. Suddenly, there's some sort of a weird movement where I, I think it's the kitchen. I can't really tell where they were located. Anthony is saying he doesn't want to be in the house when the doors are open to the bedroom and Zach comes out and says, well, they're already open. This is when Zach asks Anna and Anthony to leave the room now that they're going to investigate the mother's room. Anthony gets sick in the garage. He starts obviously sweating, some sort of like a moaning or growling noise. And the girlfriend, Anna, is once again giving me some really weird vibes. She's covering her face, she's covering her mouth, she's turning around against the garage door, she's not facing Anthony. If it were me and my boyfriend or husband were having a serious ill possession, I would be in tune to that person to make sure that they were okay. So for her to not be able to look and look away, she was like physically affected by it as well. I just want to compare you know, when they went to Utah during that possession, the wife and husband, the wife was overly involved with her husband. Are you okay? Can I get you water? Talk to me. What's going on? And this girl was just totally not in tune to him. And I could not figure out why, if it's somebody that you love and care about, why you can't be there for them. Why are you turned away? She looked extremely uncomfortable or embarrassed and I just wasn't sure what was happening. It seemed extremely disconnected. I was weirded out at some point that Anthony sounded like he was like laughing or cackling in the garage while this possession was happening and the bishop comes over to attempt to relieve him from this oppression possession that is occurring as we speak. I love Aaron. I really appreciate his authenticity because <laughs> he goes in the room with the PSB7 and suddenly um, this voice comes through that says, looking. I love how authentic Aaron is because his reactions are the way we react, right? We are like, oh my God, like this is shocking. Did you hear that? This is happening. So I really like Aaron being on camera because we know that he's going to be himself. He's going to be authentic. So I really am starting to appreciate Aaron more than anyone else. So now suddenly they have a camera in the mother's room, which has supposedly been wound and bound and taped up and shut forever because quote, no one wants you in there, but they suddenly capture a glimpse of a floating balloon inside of the bedroom. Now, unless Pennywise has come up from the depths of the sewer and left that balloon in there before anyone knew about it, then they weren't being completely forward and, you know, upfront about having those doors shut all the time. If I'm assuming correctly, a balloon that has helium in it will probably go flat within three to five days, sooner rather than later. Let's give them a little bit of wiggle room and say it was five days. Still, there, that room was not completely enclosed and shut down the way they made it appear. They made it seem like they lock it so tight that nobody ever goes in there. It's like, well, someone went in there and took a balloon and I'm kind of strangely weirded out by this. I'm obviously, being an investigator and saying you had some someone went in there don't make it seem like no one's been in there because the helium would have deflated by now if it was super old there's this rite of exorcism that starts to happen on anthony in the garage zach says that he's in the mom's room looking for clues and then suddenly through the psb7 you get this quote that says you missed it i like answers like that because once again you're verifying intelligent contact while you're doing an investigation Suddenly they find this like lock of hair that's inside of the mother's cabinet. And the concern that I had with that is if the father is quote hexing her or you know performing occult rituals towards the mother, sometimes people feel like you can only fight fire with fire. Meaning 
if she felt like she was being hexed or some sort of satanic rituals were being put against her, or black magic, whatever, she probably thought the only way she could fight it back was with the same sort of rituals, either towards him or attempting to push the negative energy away from her. A kid's voice comes through saying it's lucky, meaning the lock of hair, that concerns me. I don't like children voices, especially when you're in a demonic case. Suddenly a darker voice comes on the PSB7 that says, I'm right here and the word Satan. Now we go back into the garage. There's still an exorcism going on with Anthony. The girlfriend is completely turned around. She's crying and I still can't tell. Is it fear? Is she hiding something? Is she embarrassed? I just got a strange vibe off of how she was presenting herself around the person that she says she won't leave because she loves him. At this point in the episode, I actually laugh because now you have Sister Mary, who I think is like a G-thug. She's in the garage talking to Anthony and she's like, whose house is this? Tell me, whose house is this? <laughs> your damn house, that's right, it's your damn house. She kept saying that, I thought it was so funny because she's basically trying to give him the empowerment to take this back over as your own. Don't be weak and be kicked around and let this take on your life. So Zach's still looking through the closets, looking through this woman's possessions, which I'm not sure if I would have done that without permission, that's just me. And suddenly a woman's voice comes through the PSP7 and shouts, stop. Once again, this is that intelligent contact that I love. The SLS Zach is using, suddenly we hear like this deep growl. They capture a figure um, that is standing kind of by the inside of the bed. This is when Billy starts to get sick. He runs out. The It's kind of chaos going on. The bishop does like this rite of exorcism on Billy and obviously he feels like it's not enough so he decides to take himself out and cleanse himself. So I just wanted to educate you guys really quick on Palo Santo wood is. It's a mystic tree that grows out of South America and it's related to things like frankincense, myrrh, and copal. I have used frankincense and myrrh, in fact, I've talked about it on this channel. In fact, the person that taught me about frankincense and myrrh was Billy. It means literally holy wood. It says that it has healing properties that are similar to sage and cedar. It is a strong medicine that's heavily popularized by keeping energies grounded and clear. It's uplifting, it raises your vibration in preparation for <clears throat> meditation or a deeper connection to creation. The healing benefits behind it are traditionally used for colds, flu symptoms, stress, asthma, headaches, anxiety, depression, inflammation, emotional pain, and more. It says that it's a great aromatherapy to use during massage and it cleanses and calms the immune system and nervous system for recovery of illness. So I just wanted to let you guys know what he was using I actually found it funny that he was like, no exorcist, you're not enough, I'll take my own stuff, I'll go outside, and I got, I got this, I got this. Billy is outside, I think that they had the new camera tech go out there and talk to him, and he says, it is not one, it's many. I love how intuitive Billy is, he's really, I mean, I think Aaron has the actual like hand-in-hand -hand, um, interactions like with the other side, which is why we see those authentic interactions and emotions that he portrays. But Billy is so intuitive and I wish that he would just keep pushing it a little bit further because I like to go off my intuitive senses as well. And hearing him just say so predominantly, there is not one, there is many. It's just like the Titanic episode. I love those intuitive feelings when you verbalize them. So suddenly now we're turning back to Zach. He's doing this voiceover stating that the bishop has given specific instructions for the ashes because he believes that the ashes still have some sort of a hex or negative energy connected to them and he has suggested to remove the ashes from the home. He's also suggested to put the ashes to rest properly. He says that the mom was consumed by negative energy and hexed, and the bishop says probably by a demonic entity. That is why they quote, believe she was taken by demons. Now there's this struggle going back and forth with, you know, where are we gonna put the ashes tonight? Obviously you can't go roll up to a cemetery and say I need a slot for my mom at, four in the morning and no one knows what to do with the ashes so Zach says we can take them to my museum. Oh god I would not want my mom's ashes in Zach's museum. That's just me being completely honest. I mean look, 
when the bishop says specific instructions to put the mother to rest properly, is that really a bishop's decision or is that a family's decision? Are we getting into morals and ethics or are we getting into religious requirements? So just giving you an example, um, my grandmother, her last wishes were to be cremated and then she did want a grave slot and a headstone. That was my grandmother's wishes. When she passed away, she did have a boyfriend and they had been dating for many years, like 30 years. Her boyfriend was extremely angry at us as a family because he was very Catholic. Most of the time, Catholics do not believe in cremation. They believe in keeping the body whole, um, you know, being put into a casket and then lowered into the ground. That was not my grandmother's wishes. So of course we went by my grandmother's will and wishes because I am a firm believer in giving that person their final wishes. So for the bishop to say, put your mother to rest properly, is properly a term that is requested by the bishop saying, I believe she needs a grave slot. I believe that you need to put her where her final requests and wishes were, we don't really know. But he seems like he was very close to his mother, which is why I'm assuming that he kept her ashes in the home. Some people may think that's gross or weird. Other people would say, no, I have my mother's ashes or my grandmother's ashes. The concern I had was where are the ethical, moral, religious requirements or ethics that are behind laying someone, quote, to rest, or in his words, the bishop's word, putting someone to rest properly. What is that definition? And there are many definitions, might I add. It depends on if she had last requirements or a will, or if she left it up to her children to decide. I don't think that her requirement was probably you know, being in Zach's museum, which I find sad. Did she want to be laid to rest in a grave slot and the family couldn't afford you know, to purchase the grave slot, like I've told you guys, it's extremely expensive. And on top of that, you have to buy a grave marker, which is minimum like $5,000. I just hope that the family is doing this either by the mother's last wishes or what the family really wants for her. A lot of you have asked me, oh, you've been to the museum a ton of times. Is the mom still in the museum? Well, I'll tell you that the shelf that he put her on in the episode is a shelf, ironically, next to Ed Gein's room, which I don't really think I agree with that either because Ed Gein was a monster who <laughs> would murder women, so I definitely wouldn't want my mom on a shelf next to Ed Gein's room, that's for sure. I didn't see it, I didn't pay attention. At first, Zach says that it's a temporary fix, and then at the end of the episode, you hear Anthony the son say, can I come visit her anytime you want? And Zach's like, yeah, anytime. So I don't really know what happened after that. I don't know if she's still there. Next time I go to the museum, I'll look and pay attention. I'm assuming they probably moved her if they are keeping her ashes in there. Zach probably doesn't want people, you know, bothering those ashes or being nosy regarding them because he's trying to have respect for his friend. Or is he? by putting his friend's mother on display. I don't really have that answer. I found this episode extremely strange. I do believe that there is something dark in that house because at the end they found like throw up in the jar and it was black, which I thought was really gross. Like why haven't y'all gone in to clean up her room? They found the lock of hair, which is obviously related to some sort of ritual. They had evidence that there was something in there. Everyone was getting sick, like the energy was bouncing around from person to person. Do I think the related incidences in that corner of actual location pinpointed on the map, do I think it's related to that house? No, not really. How do I feel about this bishop and his education? Well, I think he is definitely out to help people, which I appreciate, but I'm still kind of curious about where he got his education and background as an exorcist because I've told you guys be very careful when people say that they're an exorcist and I mean he's going around saying he has a PhD which it's not accredited so I don't really know how I feel about that either. How do I feel about the bishop telling Anthony to put his mother to rest properly? 
I mean, maybe in Anthony's mind that she was properly put to rest because he didn't want to be separated from her, you know, and that's why he kept her ashes in the house. That's where you're getting into really in-depth religious preferences or, you know, last will and testament preferences. And I don't really know if a bishop has say in that. That's just my opinion. I'll be truthful and tell you guys that I'm extremely close with my mother. I am obviously going to respect her wishes when that day comes, but I definitely would not be putting my mother's ashes in Zach's museum. I understand that they are allegedly responding to this in lieu of being concerned that she was possessed or she had a possession or an attachment to her body, but they're living in fear. I mean, Anthony is obviously scared and afraid and he's getting these violent outlashes and no one's making sure that they're not taking care of their mental health. Depression can happen after a death in a family. I didn't sound like their mother was taking care of her health, especially if she died at home in his arms. I think this is a whole slew of problems and I really don't know where to begin other than being honest with you guys about the things I've stated. Of course I wanna hear your opinions, but I've had a ton of you guys write me on every social media platform and basically state that you're upset with the direction that Ghost Adventures is going and you're wanting my opinion on this. If you're comparing Ghost Adventures original documentary that was on sci-fi and you compare that to their first season and then you compare it to their fifth season and to their tenth season and now into their 15th and 16th season, we can say things have changed. We can say that things have not stayed the same. They have obviously progressed and it, it went from this raw, um, in your face kind of ghost hunting experience to now it's a lot of B-roll. They have directors of photography on set. They have producers on set for the B-roll. It's like, when did an exorcism suddenly become priorities and important over just the raw side of ghost hunting. First of all, you have to understand that film is an art form and no matter what, because this is a television series, it has to evolve. Look at any other reality series, The Bachelor, um, Amazing Race, even Survivor. It has evolved over time, even if it's the slightest bit. It is an art form, whether you appreciate the new art form or not. Also take in mind that I truly believe that Zack is an adrenaline junkie. So let's compare ghost hunting to BMXing. So when you're a kid and you decide that you really like BMXing, just like you do in ghost hunting, I told you I broke into graveyards and other places I shouldn't have been in as a kid with no equipment just to start ghost hunting. So as a child, when you're doing BMXing, you're gonna get some little crappy bike that's not even a real BMX bike, and you're gonna get in a lot of pain because you're gonna try to go downstairs and do jumps that you're not even capable of doing, but it's because it's that adrenaline that you love. At 18, if you wanna continue the adrenaline, now you can either upgrade your bike and actually go on real jumps, or at 18, you can actually bungee jump. Now at 18 with your ghost hunting, you can actually start purchasing good equipment because you can get a better job. You can afford cameras and digital recorders. So you're going to up your ante a little bit more. At 21 with adrenaline, now you can actually go skydiving. And with ghost hunting, you can push the bar further. You can hire a crew to go actually investigate with you and you start filming it and documenting it. And that is really kind of where Zach started. Now with the adrenaline side, you can jump up to free climbing without ropes or rock climbing or you can even do what is that called like ice that ice like crawling where people are crawling up ice caves and now with Zach he went from doing a documentary to doing a reality series and we have seen that reality series evolve over time and if you ask my personal opinion Zach cannot go back to doing the basic ghost hunting because He's chasing that dragon still. He's trying to get that adrenaline rush, the same rush he had when he first started ghost hunting to now 15 seasons in. And he has pushed the bar to the point where he's actually doing exorcisms and dealing with demonic cases. People get mad because they say, oh, Crystal's friends with Zach, so she's not going to review and call him out on things. I'm pretty sure I still do that. But I do want you to know that I will respect his art form more than anyone else's. And 
the reason I respect his art form is you guys haven't been signed to as many production companies as I have. When you get out there and you start realizing that no one knows the production side of ghost hunting, what goes into it? Pre-production. What is pre-production? You have to learn the history. You have to find the locations. You have to get approvals. You have to dedicate a certain amount of time to going there. You have to book times and locations and flights and as many people as you need on crew and on set. Then you have to prepare all of your equipment, prepare the cameras, purchase all of that equipment. Then the actual production aspect is going there and doing it. The post-production is the editing, which can take the longest. That is the longest process out of everything. People in the film industry have no idea what goes into ghost hunting and putting on a production. I respect that Zach does it so well. The issue that we as a community have is he has no competition. And you have to have competition in order to continue to raise your bar, right? No one really compares to Ghost Adventures. And that kind of sucks because we as an audience need something to compare it to or view it as. Oh, well, he's not as good as this, but this time they were really good. We have no one to compare it to. No one has been able to raise the bar the way Zach has. He's also 15 seasons in. If he didn't change something over all these seasons, he probably would have lost viewers. You have to evolve. You have to step up your game more and more each time. I understand the layout has changed, but you need to really look at this as a filmmaker and appreciate the art form the way it is. And you also have to understand that he's chasing the adrenaline dragon and it's just gonna keep continuing to get different and stranger because he's gonna keep needing those different ways to attract that adrenaline that he is dying for. As you know I love to hear from you below. Make sure you guys follow me on social media. Make sure you guys subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys give me a thumbs up and I will catch you guys next time. Hell yeah. <laughs>